Israel needs a temple. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel needs a temple, and without a temple, Israel is S-O-L. Uh, that stands for without a temple. Hello, everyone. This is Martin Zender. You are at the Revelation series. Uh, tomorrow, I will tell you how the meetings in Indianapolis went. I have to make these shows ahead of time. Now, we are in chapter 11, verse 19. We're starting a new major, major section of the unveiling namely the temple section. And it will be extremely helpful to know that from here on out until I guess until we get to chapter 20, 21, we are looking at the spiritual aspect of the kingdom. And I remind you of an important fact here. I'm going to pull it up. I'm going to quote from A.E. Nock here. It is very evident that the temple section brings before us the same era as the previous portion. This is what I told you yesterday the same era for both and with the establishment of christ's kingdom that's critical both and with the establishment of christ's kingdom with the seventh trumpet in the political section we talked about earlier that ended with the coming of christ's kingdom likewise this next section the temple section will also end with the coming of christ's kingdom but we're regressing in a way and looking at it from a spiritual from a religious rather than a political viewpoint just want to make sure you know that but um uh, let's, let me read this. It's clear that many of the same characteristics come before us such as the 144,000 we're still talking about them same characters same players on the stage and the wild beast he's mentioned in 11:7 and 13:1 if we're occupied with the same characters at the same time, it is clear that they must be considered from a new standpoint. That's right. Same characters, same time, new standpoint. And the standpoint is the, the religious supremacy of the earth. I almost said spiritual, but it's the same thing because I know I get nervous when I say the word religion. You can't believe Zender saying the word religion, but there's really one true religion and that's judaism it's the system here's here's a great uh saying the outstanding fact that the previous section is introduced by a vision of a throne and this one by a temple is sufficient for the anointed eye and that is your eye and that's my eye how significant is that the previous section is introduced by a vision of a throne remember we saw god's throne and the 24 elders, where? Around God's throne. And the animals, where were the animals? They were around God's throne. And the elders worshipped and the animals worshipped at God's throne. Here in 1119, we are introduced to a temple. For the anointed eye, that's you, that's the anointing coming on. For the anointed eye. This is significant. Now, I'm going to read the introduction to the temple section. It's only one verse, so you're going to be all right. You're going to be okay here. And the temple, I, 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 I don't say that to all of you, of course. I know. You're very patient with me. 1119, here we go. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of God's covenant was seen in his temple, and lightnings and voices and thunders and an earthquake and a great hail occurred. How about that? That's not the triple play. That's the quadruple play. That's more than that. Lightnings, voices, thunders, earthquake, great hail. Five. That's the quintuple play. Five's the number of grace, and grace oversees all these operations. But what a monumentous, it's like somebody taking one of those dynamite things and just pushing that handle down. Weird to pay attention here big time. All right, now I started the show by telling you that the Jews had to have a temple. This is why it always amuses me, actually uh, disgusts me, to see people attempting to do the Judaic system of worship. They're little wannabe Jews, and they pretend that they're worshiping God, and they're observing the feasts, and they're having their little Passover dinner, and okay, you can't do it. You can't do it, because you don't have a temple. You have to have a temple, or it's all moot. It's all, re it's all redundant. It's all uh, it's worse. There's a worse word. There's a worse word besides moot and redundant than I'm looking for. Feudal. 
that's the word, futile to worship God in the tabernacle system when there is no tabernacle system. Now, we know that God makes his home in us, but it was not always this way. I've been writing in the ZWTF about how the Spirit of God now makes its home in us. That's because, that's because when Paul began to teach our particular evangel, the temple was in ruins. It was a shambled. If it wasn't destroyed yet by Titus, probably wasn't, but the Spirit of God left it. I believe the Spirit of God left that temple. Jesus said, I'll leave your temple desolate. Your temple is left to you desolate were his words. And we know that the veil was rent, and that was a bad thing because that protected the Shekinah glory inside. When Christ was here, the Spirit of God dwelt in the temple. He left it desolate, and they sewed that veil back up and went into business. But the disciples were still in the habit. And maybe, I don't, I, this is confusing to me, maybe they thought there was a trace of the temple, there was a trace of God's presence in that temple. But all I'm telling you is that the disciples in the early chapters of Acts were hanging around the sanctuary. But here's an interesting fact about us having the Spirit of God in us. Watch this. When we're taken away out of the midst, and I believe we're the detainer that keeps the man of lawlessness from his second unveiling, that's right, I believe the man of lawlessness has two unveilings. We'll get to that later. Uh, but God will once again dwell in a temple built by hands. Now he doesn't. So you see, our presence on the earth, we are the dwelling place of God now. So if God plans to once again dwell in a temple made by human hands, and he will, and I'm not saying it's going to be the end time temple, it's going to be Ezekiel's temple that will be built in the millennium. Uh, but the fact that he's going to do that means that we can't be on the earth because God's not going to dwell in two different places. He's, he's dwelling in us now in the absence of a temple. When the temple comes back, we're not going to be here. Isn't that s splendid, really? Uh, it's the same thing um, I told you about the detainer. You know, we're ambassadors of peace. God cannot declare war on the earth as long as we're here. So when we're taken away, then the road is cleared field is open for a display of his indignation, but not while we're here. And as long as we're here and the Spirit of God makes its home in us, 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 19, 2 Corinthians 6, 15, look up those verses after this show. Look up 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 2 Corinthians 6, 15. We'll assure you the Spirit of God makes its home in you. But as long as we're here, no temple can come. Therefore, the temple requires our absence, and our absence is impending. It shall proceed forthwith. So, Israel always had this on-again, off-again relationship with the Spirit. Remember, the Spirit of God came on and off Saul. It came on the disciples for power at Pentecost. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. They all received the Spirit at Pentecost. It came to them as a cleansing when they were baptized. Acts 2.4, be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. And it filled them for utterance. Acts 1.5, I think I transposed those references. Acts 1.5, the cleansing by baptism. Acts 2.4, it filled them for utterance. When Peter proclaimed on the day of Pentecost and many heard in their own language. This was the Holy Spirit. But what this does, it, as spectacular as all this is, and as much as many Christians want to go back to the Pentecostal era, they don't realize that this is an inferior situation because it's coming on them. Oh, that's spectacular. Spirit's coming on. No, I tell you what's spectacular. Spirit dwelling in you. Oh, it's so great to go to a temple. It's so great to be with the, with the disciples hanging out in the sanctuary. No, I'll tell you what's even better. You don't have to go to a zip code to find God that he dwells w with you. So the action of the 12 indicates two facts to me. One, they didn't have the homing of the Spirit. Look up 1 Corinthians 3.16 as well. 1 Corinthians 3.16. They did not have that, the disciples at Pentecost. And number two, they were drawn to 
whatever vestige of God's presence, if any, this is what I don't understand, was left in the sanctuary. For you remember, these guys didn't know everything. For as much as they were aware, the temple was still the place. The Spirit was still coming on them. Temples, by their nature, are temporary tenements of God. The temple in the wilderness, let, let's do a quick review of the temples in the history of Israel. Because this temple we're looking at in chapter 11 is reputed to be the dwelling place of God. It will do in a pinch. Some faithful Israelites will be there. But it is the temple into which the man of lawlessness will go and proclaim himself God. Temples were temporary. The tabernacle in the wilderness was built by a model that Moses saw on the mountain. That's another great fact is temples on earth have their counterpart in heaven, the model, if you will. So Moses set up the tabernacle in the wilderness according to the instructions, and it moved with the Israelites. Camp here for a while, pick up stakes, move that thing. That would have been a big hassle, but the Israelites uh, did it. Then he changed his residence, God did, to Solomon's house. It was a permanent uh, temple. God said, David, you're a man of war. You're not going to build this for me. Solomon built a magnificent temple. It was called Solomon's temple. But it was destroyed by our friend, Nebuchadnezzar, the first ruler of the world. He's the king of the world. Now, Leonardo DiCaprio is not the king of the world. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the world. And that temple was destroyed, looted, robbed, and Zerubbabel, upon returning from Babylon, rebuilt that temple. Later, Herod had to rebuild it. What happened to the temple between Zerubbabel and Herod? I don't, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, uh, we know that there was Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, Herod's temple, and then Jesus Christ shows up. What happens then? Ooh, you had to ask, didn't you? Um, well, he says, tear down. He points at his body and he says to the crowd one day, tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. So already he's intimating that God is going to begin dwelling in a people, in a people, starting with him. The disciples weren't clear on this yet. They were sure as heck clear on it after 70 AD when the temple, Herod's temple was leveled once again and it left them without a place to uh dwell so you know that the 12 disciples are going to look forward to raising from the dead and coming into jerusalem to see a temple prepared for them ezekiel's temple that's what they live for you and i don't that's why i continually remind you while i'm happy that there will be a splendid millennial temple and that we're entering into now in the unveiling, entering into a time of analyzing the worship in Israel because worship is as important to them in politi as politics. I'm happy about that. But I'm even more thrilled by the fact that I have and you have the Spirit of God dwelling in me. We are so, this sounds highfalutin we are so above the blessings god gives to israel and even though i i love israel and i want her to get what's coming to her i want her to enter into her promises yet i'm not going to usurp her glories or her blessings to myself even if it's in the form of a magnificent temple we have so much for we have so much more than that so much more than Israel, because we have the magnificent Spirit of God dwelling within us.